Good morning. Today's scripture readings come from Genesis chapter 17, verses 1 through 7 and 15 through 16. God's covenant with Abraham. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am El Shea. Walk with me and be trustworthy. I will make a covenant between us, and I will give you many, many descendants. Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, But me, my covenant is with you. You will be the ancestor of many nations. And because I have made you the ancestor of many nations, your name will no longer be Abram, but Abraham. I will make you very fertile. I will produce nations from you and kings will come from you. I will set up my covenant with you and your descendants after you in every generation as an enduring covenant. I will be your God and your descendants, God, after you. God said to Abraham, as for your wife, Sarai, you will no longer call her Sarai. Her name will now be Sarah. I will bless her and even give you a son from her. I will bless her so that she will become nations and kings of peoples will come from her. And our next reading, Romans chapter 4, verses 13 through 25. Abraham's promise is received through faith. The promise of Abraham and to his descendants that he would inherit the world didn't come through the law, but through the righteousness that comes from faith. If they inherit because of the law, then faith has no effect and the promise has been canceled. The law brings about wrath, but when there isn't any law, there isn't any violation of the law. That's why the inheritance comes through faith, so that it will be on the basis of God's grace. In that way, the promise is secure for all of Abraham's descendants, not just for those who are related by law, but also for those who are related by the faith of Abraham, who is the father of all of us. As it is written, I have appointed you to be the father of many nations. So Abraham is our father in the eyes of God, in whom we have faith. The God who gives life to the dead and calls things that don't exist into existence. When it was beyond hope, he had faith in the hope that he would become the father of many nations in keeping with the promise God spoke to him. That's how many descendants you will have. Without losing faith, Abraham, who was nearly a hundred years old, took into account his own body, which was as good as dead, and Sarah's womb, which was dead. He didn't hesitate with a lack of faith in God's promise, but he grew strong in faith and gave glory to God. He was fully convinced that God was able to do what he promised. Therefore, it was credited to him as righteousness. But the scripture that says it was credited to him wasn't written only for Abraham's sake. It was written also for our sake because it is going to be credited to us too. It will be credited to those of us who have faith in the one who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was handed over because of our mistakes and he was raised to meet the requirements of righteousness for us. So ends our readings today. May the Lord bless our understanding. Thank you, Jean. You think when Abraham was almost 100, he would have enjoyed playing with uh, remote control cars? I, I do. Maybe not sure. I don't know.
Walt Disney created this catchy visual story that became the beginning of an entertainment universe that has even spawned the happiest place on earth before any of the other voluminous storytelling that Disney has done in our culture, there was Steamboat Willie, right? The precursor to Mickey Mouse, two of the best known rounded ears in the world at this point. Daniel Boone's stories gave embodiment to the hunger for adventure and the expansion of territory and the ideal of the rugged individualist that undergirds so much of the lore of the early United States of America. J.K. Rowling, before there was her industry, there was a compelling little spark of a tale that kept getting rejection slips, by the way, about a bespectacled boy who was not being treated very kindly by his adoptive family, living in a kind of a closet under a staircase who had not yet discovered who he was was, of course, Harry Potter. There was a comedian from the 1970s that used to tell how every one of his dad's boring stories would invariably end with, and that's how I met your mother. <laughs> All his dad's wisdom got tied back into the original story, because whatever all else happened, all the roads led through meeting your mother. Ain't it the truth, though? This morning we have this piece of the story of Abraham and Sarah. So much that comes later is rooted in this original narrative idea. Three world religions at least call Abraham and Sarah their spiritual ancestors. How many billions, with a B, billions of people have lived and died and loved and killed and built empires and upended empires in the flow and the sway and the grip of this foundational narrative and all that comes after. The story of God appearing to Abram is one of the central defining launch moments in the history of human civilization on earth. This story is a foundation under the foundations. I am El Shaddai which means God of the mountains, God of the highest place, God Almighty. I am God, and I'm inviting you into relationship, into covenant. What is covenant? Well, it's kind of like I do something, you do something, and good things will happen. But it's more than that. It's more than a quid pro quo. It is not just a contract for services and payment. It is a way of living. It's a way of living woven in together. I will be in perpetuity. I will be your God. And you will live in perpetuity as my people. And there will be blessing. There will be good outcome to our living in covenant together. In this case, permanently, through the generations that God will bring out of Abraham and Sarah. God is always promising blessing in covenant. The trouble, much of the time, happens when somebody strays outside of the covenant, but within the embrace, in the circle, good stuff. And not just for Abram and Sarai, who become Abraham and Sarah. Not just for their tribe or location. Covenant is for much more. For descendants and eventually for everybody. All three of these earth-covering religions have at their very beginning these words from Genesis 12, 3, which is five chapters before this. God says to Abram and Sarai, all the families of the earth will be blessed because of you. That's the blessing part of the covenant. What is the requirement part of the covenant? Well, it starts out, at least in this version, in Genesis 17, I am El Shaddai. Walk with me and be trustworthy. 
the defining instructions, behaviors, requirements of the foundational covenant for millions of people over millennia, walk with me and be trustworthy. You could fit that on a bumper sticker. You probably shouldn't. Because I think this goes a bit beyond being a good boy or a nice girl. Walk with me and be trustworthy. Don't let us miss this. Because it, it might be a little more depth there than being an influencer on social media or selling a whole bunch of stadium tickets. Not that there's anything wrong with that. It's just that it might be easy for us to walk right past this without appreciating the vastness. Abram gets the gravity of this invitation. He falls on his face. Yeah. Now, that is not all. Because we know that there are other things written here, to be sure. Our neighbors know there are other things written here. Pretty much everybody you will ever invite to church knows that there are other things written here. There were originally some other ideas about what it meant to live in covenant with El Shaddai. Go kill everyone in that city. Men, women, and children, and animals. Cut off parts of your body. If you don't, you're not part of the covenant. Eat these foods and not those foods. Kill people who do this bad thing, like back-talking your parents. That's in there. Or having sex with the wrong person. That's in there. Take this land that already has people living on it and raising families on it and growing food on it and wipe out everybody on it. So what do we who desire to walk with God and live trustworthy lives do with some of these other seemingly contradictory, quite disturbing, ancient requirements? <coughs> Are we supposed to pick and choose? Absolutely. Absolutely we are supposed to pick and choose. We always have and we must. In fact, to live in covenant with God, we must decide and live in a group of people deciding what it still means. I'll never forget as long as I live the charismatic preacher standing in the front of the room, holding up his Bible and yelling, if you tear out this page from the Bible and then that page from the Bible, where are you going to stop? And at a young stage, at a young stage of my faith development, I found that to be a compelling question. I struggled with that. And it's taken me maybe close to 30 years to grow into my answer. Thankfully, the world around me has already figured out a thing or two. I'm a little slow sometimes. I don't think we rip pages out. I think we read them respectfully, compassionately, contemplatively, with a reverent understanding that we are always being invited deeper and deeper into covenant with our loving God. And I think we rightfully and joyfully and humbly, but confidently, leave in its ancient context the passage about murdering people who love someone of the same gender. We take a hard pass on the one about selling our daughter into slavery. We stopped some time ago killing people who worked on the Sabbath. That was a good choice on our part. We don't consider unworthy of joining in worship a person who has touched a dead body, especially if they use some form of sanitizing agent. We don't expel people who plant different crops next to each other or shave their beards incorrectly or wear garments of differing threads. I would not advocate for grace to do any of those covenant requirements, and I'm thankful that we are not telling other people that they should do those. If somebody wants to say we're throwing out sacred pages of the Bible, 
I will pray for them and with them if they will let me. But Nate, make no mistake about the pages we keep. Walk with God and be trustworthy. Or as Jesus put it, love the Lord your God with all you have and all you are, and love your neighbor as yourself. And go be a neighbor to everybody who needs that love. So yes, we pick and we choose, but it doesn't seem to make it any easier, does it? Even the pages we keep give us work for a lifetime and give us all-encompassing, invigorating, even overwhelming vision for Christ's church. Walk with me, says El Shaddai, and be trustworthy. Oh, do we have our work cut out for us. We have the meaning of our lives and our faith right in front of us and in front of the world. We have covenant to live into and out from. We have covenant to live under and on and in the midst of. Walk with God Almighty and be trustworthy. We said a couple of weeks ago that what we know now has to inform how we live our faith now. Can there be any way to live in covenant with El Shaddai knowing what we know now other than longing and striving and working to be a blessing to all the families of the earth. Can anyone tell me how we could possibly still find any way to justify some idea that God has told us we are better and we need to judge those people or change these people or dispossess those people or harm these people? How could we still think any of that could be any part of our receiving the divine visitation. How could the blessing be for anybody but for all the families? How could covenant with a just and loving God be with anyone if not with everyone? Would you want to traffic? In a religion or an ideology or a spirituality that singled out your group for good things, and people from some other group, tribe, belief, region, hair color, language, creed, diet, size, accent, gender, musical preference, mobility level, or educational history for lesser things? I got bad news and I got good news. The bad news is the book has all kinds of verses you can use for nefarious purposes. And the book has been used by many and to some extent by each of us. The book has been used since it was written for some terrible things. The good news is we don't have to live like that. We are invited to walk with God and be trustworthy, to live in ongoing and renewed covenant together, inviting everyone we will ever see into this blessing. God continues to be God. God continues to reveal God's self to humankind. It says Abram was 99 years old when God appeared to him. I don't think you have to be 99 to be invited to walk with God. That would certainly put me out of it and most of the people in this room, although there might be at least one that we maybe should pay special attention to, right? Just say. But at any age, we pray for the eyes to see and the ears to hear God continuing to reveal the divine self, the El Shaddai. God Almighty, even us youngsters keep being invited deeper into covenant. Walk with God and be trustworthy. That's enough. The rest will come from that walk and from that being. But knowing what we know now, we know that living in covenant with the one who made all of us, loves all of us, holds all of us, living in covenant with God Almighty means we will let some of the ancient 
warlike, blood-stained pages fall to the floor. Because God calls us in Holy Scripture to be a blessing to all the families of the earth and teaches us to love God and our neighbor and invites us to walk with God and be trustworthy. And those are the pages we keep. Amen. change of name, before the first signs of new life showed the beginnings of promises fulfilled, you asked Abram to make his home among foreigners and to share the blessing that was to come. And now, O oh God, you ask the same faith of us, the faith to count ourselves among the least, to find our place alongside the poor and the broken, the faith to trust in your mercy and your promises and to share what we have received, the faith to wait expectantly for your reign of justice and equity, together with those who most need its gifts. Teach us to be children of Abram and Sarai, sharers of the blessings we enjoy, the blessing of plenty shared with those who have need, the blessing of healing shared with those who are sick and wounded, the blessing of joy shared with those who celebrate and of tears shared with those who grieve. The blessing of friendship shared with those who are excluded and of solidarity with those who fight injustice. The blessing of peace shared with those in conflict and of confrontation shared with those who bring harm. And in some small way, may our faith and our sharing help to bring your promises into being in our world. Amen. Let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. Power 